Energy makes the world go round. It has since the beginning of time. But today, the ways we power our world are changing. Here at the American Le Mans Green Challenge in Monterey, California, some of the world's top drivers and most sophisticated cars are competing. But this isn't your typical race. And these aren't your typical cars. In fact, what's happening here is nothing short of a revolution. For a hundred years, we've been driving around on fossil fuels, on the track and on our highways. But at the rate we're burning through them, it's only a matter of time before we run out. The energy challenge is about finding alternative ways to power our vehicles, to keep up with, and maybe even defeat the reigning champ. You can actually win and you can compete on a, an alternative. Gasoline is not the be-all and end-all. This is a race we're all in a race to determine our energy future. It is a challenge unlike anything we've faced before. And it's all about finding new ways to do one very important thing. Work. There's always been a lot of it to do. Back in the old days, we had to do it all ourselves. Then, we figured out animals could do some of it for us. We've harnessed the power of rivers and the wind. Then we took a truly giant step. For most of the 20th century, we've lived the energy dream. Thanks to abundant, reliable, and cheap fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. Today, fossil fuels still drive our cars and light up our cities like there's no tomorrow. The thing about tomorrow, though, is that sooner or later, it's here. Many experts believe we've already burnt through half the planet's recoverable oil. And eventually, will run out of coal and natural gas too. As supplies dwindle, prices will soar, energy will be harder and harder to get. Add to that the environmental and health costs of drilling, mining and burning fossil fuels, plus the global security risks of relying on fuels from other countries, and there's no question we've got a problem. It'd be nice if the problem had an easy solution. One that didn't force us to sacrifice too much of our high-octane lifestyle. We all wish there were a single fix that would allow us to continue powering our machines. And there's no shortage of ideas for an energy silver bullet. In Japan, Scientists want to put solar panels in a place where the sun always shines, out of space. Beaming power down from a two square mile array in space could provide electricity for more than a quarter million homes. Australia is looking to grind its way down to the Earth's crust, where an unlimited source of geothermal energy is waiting to be tapped. In New York City, they're taking advantage of the East River tides by installing underwater turbines with the potential to power more than a thousand homes. But the problem with most of these technologies is that they're still being developed or may only supply a fraction of our energy needs. To provide all the power we would ever need without using fossil fuels, well, that's not so easy. Just ask anyone at the National Ignition Facility in Central California, where they're working on the ultimate silver bullet, a technology that's been on the drawing board for the last 50 years, nuclear fusion.
fusion is actually the ultimate form of solar power because it makes energy the exact same way the sun does. Our sun is a million times the size of Earth. Its immense gravity smashes hydrogen atoms together with such force that they fuse, releasing enormous amounts of energy as heat. If we could harness all the energy the sun makes in one minute, we could power the whole world for more than a million years. That's impossible. But we may have another option, building our own miniature sun here on Earth. More ready. Now down. More ready. Get operator, Pepsi Sultan. Got it. Today, the National Ignition team is hoping to take a giant step towards that goal. Charge complete. Got it. Right. Project director Ed Moses knows a lot is riding on what they're about to do. Sequence run to minus 60. We are desperate as a species for new ways to get clean energy. Pepsi's ready. So this is the ultimate clean, renewable energy. Got it. We're using energy from water. Pack ready. And by just taking the molecules of hydrogen and H2O, we can get a huge amount of energy. Cryo. Fusion holds so much promise that we've spent 50 years and billions of dollars trying to make it a reality. But so far, it is yet to produce a single watt of power. Power conditioning charge. Triggering fusion in a lab is a very tricky business. This multi-billion dollar machine is made of 192 lasers, the most powerful lasers on Earth. To create the heat and pressure found inside the sun, the lasers have to strike a hydrogen-filled capsule the size of a pea. To trigger fusion, all the lasers must hit the target at exactly the same time. A direct hit, hydrogen atoms fuse, and you have clean, limitless energy forever. Get operator, Pepsi Sultan. Copy. Today, after 10 years of tireless work, the fusion team is finally ready to take on what's probably the hardest part of the whole process. Let's get ready here. Hitting the bullseye. Right. If these tests work, we are one step closer to fusion. System shut countdown state. Use charging. Copy. Inside the chamber is a blank. Shot direct. No fuel. Shot director ready. But it will be a perfect test target. Starting system shot sequence on my mark. Three, two, one. I'm not sure what we're going Bring up the polar then. Oh, there's the picture we want to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You look right here. 284.9 terawatts. Marvelous. For the Looks team, like it. it's a momentous breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Miraculous shot. Mm -hmm. Now that they know they can hit the target, the next step is to fuel the capsule. Then, at least in theory, they could be moments from fusion. Every day we're getting more and more data. Hopefully in the next year and a half, we'll show that it could actually be real. This is what it's gonna to take to solve our energy problems. Hundreds, thousands of attempts made by hundreds, thousands of people until one day, maybe, they hit pay dirt. In the next 40 years, there's gonna be three billion people more on Earth. More people that live in China and India and Southeast Asia are going to be here with us. If we don't find a way through this, things are gonna get very uncomfortable. What are we gonna do? The answer may turn out to be fusion or some other silver bullet. Or it may not be a silver bullet at all. How many times do we plug in every day? How many times do we flick a switch? Turn a key? Click a remote? Punch in a phone number? And what would life be like if we couldn't? We rely on two major forms of energy to keep our world powered. 
the fuel that goes into the tank and the electricity that comes out of the socket. When we harnessed electricity in the 19th century, everything changed. Suddenly, a couple of copper wires going into your home or factory could supply the same power as a team of horses or a raging river. Coal may have jump-started the Industrial Revolution, but electricity made it hum. We've come a long way since the early days of electric power, but the principle has remained exactly the same. All you have to do is spin a wheel. The spinning wheel. It's at the heart of nearly every power system on the planet. Take a magnet, spin it inside a coil of wire to free up some electrons, and now you have a generator. This is the electricity machine. The fuel spins a wheel, the wheel turns a magnet. The magnet releases electrons. And presto, everything you need to power a slew of modern appliances. The process is pretty much the same no matter what fuel you use to turn the wheel. Burn coal, boil water, generate steam, spin the wheel. Out comes electricity. Swap out coal for natural gas, oil, nuclear fission, even hydropower. They'll spin the wheel just as well. Whatever the source, all we care about is that the power eventually finds its way into our homes and workplaces. To get there, it has to travel over hundreds or even thousands of miles of power lines through a network we call the grid. Across the globe, the grid links the raw power generated at thousands of power plants to hundreds of millions of users, you and me. And keeping the whole system running, are the grid engineers. The German power company, 50 Hertz, provides electricity to nearly 20 million homes. Our dispatchers in the control room have a job quite comparable to air traffic controllers. Every second of the day, they keep the balance between production and consumption. Every second, demand supply at the same level. For decades, Germany relied on coal to provide most of its electricity. Now it's committed to powering half its electric grid with renewable energy by 2050. Generated mainly with one resource, the wind. Turning and turning all day long, a modern wind turbine is a huge spinning wheel in its own right. Some reach 500 feet high. Blades longer than the wings of a 747 catch the wind, and a generator transforms the energy into electricity. Wind power is now one of the fastest growing industries on Earth. In 2009, China became the third largest producer of wind power in the world, after Germany and the US. They're now the world's largest manufacturer of wind turbines. China's invested massively in wind technology. In the past five years, they've essentially doubled the amount of energy they're producing from wind each and every single year. Perhaps more importantly, China plans on dominating the industry for making these wind turbines, an industry that could be worth not just billions of dollars, but perhaps trillions of dollars. Wind technology is taking off so fast that by mid-century, it could surpass coal as the number one power source on the grid. That's not such great news for the grid engineers, because they know all too well that wind power has a serious drawback. Wind is a quite volatile source of electricity. When it's blowing, it's there. When it's not, it's gone. It's not enough to send electric power into our homes and workplaces most of the time. It has to be there all the time. Something fossil fuels like coal do very well. With renewable energy, it's not so easy. But now, a group of American pioneers is taking on the challenge of making wind power more consistent. Led by a man 
whose entire career has been shaped by the wind. Don Montague began sailing at the age of eight. By the time he was 20, he had won his first windsurfing competition. He discovered early on that the higher he set his sails, the faster he went. When sailboats are racing, sometimes only the top third of their sails actually working. Put a kite up at, let's say, 100 meters or 200 meters or 500 meters, you realize, wow, there is a lot of power here. And uh, the wind is perfect right now. In 2006, with $10 million in seed money, he and his colleagues started an alternative energy company. Back up. Vertical off. Okay, I think we're ready. At a decommissioned airbase on San Francisco Bay, Makani Power is developing a kite-based technology that could make wind power a lot more reliable. We're ready to launch. To do it, they've got to fly their renewable power machines up where the wind blows the hardest and most steadily. Okay, wind is good. Everyone's ready? What looks like a model airplane is actually a kite. Essentially, a wing with a long tether attached. For takeoff, the propellers act like they do on a normal plane. But once the kite reaches altitude, the propellers start to work like generators. They convert wind energy into electricity and feed it down to the base station via the tether. Could you extract all the power that you need from wind and power all of humanity? The answer is yes, you certainly could. No problem at all. Just not yet. Makani's kite flies like a dream. It can generate power for a half a dozen homes. But in order to deliver energy consistently, they need a kite that can fly itself. Not just for hours at a time, but for weeks, even years. No one's ever done it, and they're struggling. It looks like it wasn't even... It's really a controls problem. And fundamentally, that's, that's where all the innovation needs to happen. We envision completely autonomously launching and landing these systems so they can be deployed and recovered, completely computer controlled. If they can jump this hurdle, Makani's high altitude kites will be able to reach into the sky and pull down a source of energy far more powerful than anything a regular wind turbine can tap. But powerful as it is, wind isn't the only game in town. There's another even more impressive source of energy out there if we can just find a way to hold on to it. Natural sources of energy are all around us. But we can't put the wind into our gas tanks or plug our TV into the sun. We have to convert renewable energy into a form we can use. Of all the energy we find in the natural world, by far the most powerful is the sun. And there's more than one way to harness it. In southern Spain, hundreds of mirrors are tracking the sun, focusing its rays on a tank of water atop a tower nearly 400 feet tall. Each mirror can only raise the water temperature by a few degrees. But target 600 of them at the same spot, and the temperature shoots up to 500 degrees. That's more than enough to turn the water into steam, which is then shot into turbines, which spin the wheel. Electricity. Today, the field of solar panels generates enough power for over 15,000 homes. And as more panels come online, that number could reach 200,000. This is the first commercial power plant in Europe to harvest the energy from the sun in this way. But it shares solar power's one built-in, and some say fatal flaw. It's a fair weather friend. When the sun shines, we're good to go. But when it's gone, so goes our energy. 
Not really the most stable way to keep our civilization running. To power the future of solar, we need to learn how to hold a piece of the sun in reserve. And Spain has found a way to do this as well. The Andesol solar thermal plant is the largest solar plant in the world. Here, they're not just collecting the sun's energy, they're stockpiling it. The problem with the, the renewable resource is that it's not controllable. Uh, the wind blows when blows and goes uh, when, when it decides to go. The same happens with the sun. If renewable is not controllable, uh, you have nothing at the end of the day. Under the intense glare of the midday sun, the mirrors produce a tremendous amount of heat, more than the generators can use for electricity. Their answer is to store that heat in a 28,000 ton vat of molten salt. The salt soaks up the solar energy, which can be tapped for power hours or even days later. Every day when the sun goes down, Andesol's engineers switch off the solar mirrors and start pumping heat from the storage tanks. At night, turbines keep churning out electricity for about 40,000 homes. And the locals who rely on the power are none the wiser. Government-run plants like these can convert solar energy into electricity on a massive scale. But the beauty of sun power is that no one owns it. With a little ingenuity, anyone can tap into it. Here in the US, the race to find the solar silver bullet is heating up. But the true pioneers aren't necessarily who you might expect. Frank Schubert has reinvented himself several times in the course of his life. He's been a professional musician, uh, architect. Six, five foot sections. He's even designed habitats for explorers on Mars. Now, he's turning all that creativity towards the sun. Basically, making music and, and making machines is the same thing. It comes from the same spirit. You have to have it in your head first, and then you make it happen. When America's largest olive producer wanted to find alternative ways to power its operations, Schubert knew he found his next project. Running day and night, the Musco family olive company's factory gobbles up nearly as much electricity as a thousand homes. Schubert began by designing a solar thermal array of mirrors, a lot like the one in Spain. The array provided power during the day. The problem, once again, was what to do when the sun didn't shine. Then Schubert had a revelation. He had access to a solar-charged resource that was hiding in plain sight. This factory cans more olives each year than there are people on planet Earth. Schubert's aha moment came when he realized that the solar energy he needs to power this factory was already in the factory. The problem was, it was being shipped away as trash. Olive pits. Processing, you know, 13 billion olives a year, they create a lot of waste. Waste in the sense that they don't know what to do with it. But Schubert knew exactly what to do with it. Just like the wood in your fireplace, olive pits contain a lot of stored solar energy, which can be burned to generate electricity. With millions of olive pits piling up each day, they provided the perfect renewable energy source, possibly enough to power the entire plant on cloudy days and at night. So you're telling me you, you can power this factory with basically what was waste? Yes. Basically, this is a sun storage device here. It, it gathers the energy from the sun, it puts it into this olive pit. We extract that heat and we boil water with it and make steam and, and it's run It's such engines. a simple idea. It seems like it's something that people would have done a long time ago, but we've sort of forgotten that really we get so much energy from the sun and it's just trapped everywhere around us. Yeah, it is. Solar mirrors for the daytime 
olive pits for the night. It's creative thinking like this that will help us find new ways to keep the electric current flowing. Unlike our factories and homes, our vehicles aren't connected to an electric grid. Finding powerful, clean, and renewable fuels to keep them running poses different problems, with different innovators racing to solve them. I love riding around in my horse and buggy, but I'd hate to have to do this every day. Luckily, I don't have to. The days when people got around like this are long gone. Today, a world without cars is almost unthinkable. Without fast, reliable transportation, avocados sit on a farm in California. Computer chips never make it out of China, and our overnight packages return to sender. From motorcycles, to tractor trailers, to cargo ships, it all depends on the internal combustion engine, which in turn depends on, you guessed it, fossil fuels like gasoline. Burn a fossil fuel and you spin the wheel, which literally drives a car. It's cheap and it packs a huge energy punch in a very small package. And that's why any fuel going up against the reigning champion is going to have a fight on its hands. The American Lamar Green Challenge has turned a racetrack into a laboratory. What engineers and drivers learn here today will reap benefits far beyond the track. What you do in racing, all the things you're looking to get better at are the same things that you're looking for in a streetcar. Whether it's aerodynamics, better fuel economy, all those are key in racing. Today's favorite is car number 45 a Porsche GT3 powered by gasoline. The challenges include a number of cars running on renewable fuels, biobutanol, cellulosic ethanol, and clean diesel. They're here to give gas a run for its money. Over the years, Lord Paul Drayson has seen alternative fuels go from being a laughing stock to serious contenders. The other racers looked at us as like we'd gone a bit crazy and made fun of me saying, well, are you going to drive in open-toed sandals now? Are you going to be eating lentils? Well, what's with this? But then when we put the car on pole and won the race, they weren't laughing anymore. In a grueling four-hour endurance race like the Green Challenge, sheer power alone won't always win the day. Fuel economy will be a key factor. The guy who's going to win that race isn't necessarily the fastest car. The fewer stops you have to make to fill her up, that's time on the racetrack, not stopped in the pit lane. The need to cut down on pit stops is also driving another technology being tested here today. A car not with one engine, but two. A hybrid. Hybrids combine a standard internal combustion engine with an electric motor powered by a battery. Better fuel economy could save the hybrid two pit stops. And the power boost from the battery makes the car a little quicker coming out of the turns. Four hours into the race, the gas-powered Porsche is leading the pack as expected. But surprisingly, a biofuel-powered Corvette is still very much in the hunt. And the hybrid is holding its own. It may be the power from the hybrid's batteries that's making the difference. Today, batteries power a lot of things. MP3 players, cell phones, and cars. In theory, batteries could eliminate one of renewable energy's most persistent stumbling blocks, storage. The battery we're all familiar with is basically a device that converts chemical energy into electricity. All it has to do is store energy so it can be discharged later. The battery doesn't care if the energy originally came from coal or nuclear, wind or the sun. Here at MIT, Don Sadaway runs a lab whose sole purpose is to reinvent the battery. If he has his way, one day,
there may be batteries storing enough renewable energy to power our houses and even entire towns. If we had proper, cheap, scalable storage, then that would make people turn to wind and solar, not as supplemental, but as the primary source of electricity. Storing renewable energy in batteries sounds pretty straightforward. If one battery can hold a little, then many should hold a lot. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Here's where we are now, and that's where we want to be. So that this is the concept of scalability, and the way not to do it is to put 100,000 of these and string them together like a bunch of Christmas tree lights. We have to think very, very differently about batteries. Putting a thousand car batteries in your basement would be way too expensive. A single giant battery might work if we could just figure out how to build one. The batteries we're most familiar with have two solid metal ends, positive and negative electrodes. They're connected by an acid that conducts the electricity. Sadoway realized that he could design a much larger battery using liquids with molten metal as the electrodes and a molten salt to conduct the electricity. These liquid materials, kept at a temperature of more than 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, could quickly absorb and retain an enormous amount of energy at a third the cost of today's most powerful batteries. The only way that the battery wins is to be cheap, cheap, cheap. Once they're perfected, a bank of liquid batteries could power all of New York City with nothing but the wind and solar energy to charge them. Put one in every town, and our past storage problems could be over. Sadoway's mega battery is just one of many big ideas designed to transform our entire energy system with one game-changing invention. But for some of today's renewable energy pioneers, small is beautiful. They believe in the power of change that individuals can start making right now. Many of us assume that energy has to come from some giant oil company or electric utility. But for some alternative energy pioneers, real change can be in the hands of individuals. And when it comes to renewable energy we can install ourselves, the leader of the pack is the photovoltaic cell, otherwise known as PV. Put them up, plug them in, and walk away. PV panels don't really look like much, but once you get them in there, they start generating electricity for as long as the sun shines. When sunlight strikes the silicon panel, photons knock electrons loose, creating current. From there, the electricity can flow right into our homes. For years, solar panels came in only one flavor, black rectangles that you mounted on your roof. If we want to make alternative energy part of our lives, why not make it part of our homes? Literally. With the invention of flexible PV cells, architect Sheila Kennedy says it's time to do just that. We can't continue to think about solar panels as a piece of kind of quote-unquote infrastructure. We believe in playing with materials. That point will be on the, mm -hmm. the new photovoltaic materials can be built right into our clothes, curtains, even bedspreads. They call this a soft house. What we have here is a soft house curtain and it's a two-sided curtain. On the one side, you have photovoltaics that are integrated into the textile, and on the other, you have high-brightness LEDs. Inside each curtain, a small battery holds the solar charge until the power is needed. Operating the system is about as tough as using an MP3 player. The electricity it generates won't power the whole house, but it will go part way. The soft house curtain, in general, looks at taking, um, I think, a portion of the energy that you consume as a homeowner out of the grid. Taking a load off the grid means fewer power lines, less energy, and less development. 
The soft house is also about private citizens doing something now to change the way they use energy. The same reasoning behind Caltech chemist Nate Lewis's new solar project. Except he's doing away with the photovoltaic cells altogether and replacing them with a fresh coat of paint. Solar paint. So you can spray this stuff on or paint it on and it becomes a solar, uh, a photovoltaic cell? Exactly. Itself. It makes electricity from sunlight. Wow. Take a little scoop and you want to put a little bit like on that much? One more. The process begins by brushing the paint onto three glass slides, just like you'd silk screen a T-shirt. That's pretty good. Up, 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 and there you go. Pick one up. Yeah, you Hold you it can. up to the light. A chemical in this paint absorbs sunlight. Absolutely. We're going to now right. dye it and make it colored so it'll absorb sunlight. Wow. Paint it on your roof, shine sunlight on it, and... You've now harnessed the energy of the sun in a system that you made with your own two hands on your rooftop. When sunlight hits the solar paint, it releases a flow of electrons. Add some wires, hook it up to your circuit box, and there you have it. Electricity. Do you really think that in our lives times we'll be able to go to a store and just buy a couple of buckets of solar paint and come home and slap it on and start producing electricity? Yeah, I think actually we'll figure out how to do that. We already know how to do that. Yeah. It's just that we have to we make it cheap and last and stable at the same time. And cheap and stable. Not words you typically associate with renewables. But back in Germany, they're hoping to change that. People tend to use a lot less power at night. If grid engineers can sock away the energy wind turbines generate during non-peak hours, they can tap into it during the day when it's needed the most. Martin Reinhardt is one of 50 Berlin commuters who've signed up for a unique pilot program to see if electric cars can soak up all that wasted power. When he gets home in the evening, Martin plugs in his electric car so it can charge overnight when electricity is cheapest. But here's the beauty of the idea. Soon, electric cars may also be able to send the energy in their batteries back to the grid. Here's how it could work. Say Martin is taking a trip to Spain for the week, leaving his electric car plugged in at home. Since the car is connected to the utility via the internet, the grid engineers can control the flow of electricity. When there's a lull in the wind or the sun isn't shining, they can reverse it. Now, instead of the grid charging Martin's car, his car is charging the grid, providing temporary power for up to 20 homes. And Martin also gets to charge the utility company for the energy he's giving back. What happened while Martin was in Spain can happen every night. As more and more electric cars take to the road, this could be the wave of the future. Buy energy in the usual way or sell it back for a profit. Those are the kind of choices most people want. And the race to provide them is running full throttle into the final laps. The search for clean, efficient alternatives to fossil fuels is powered by a dream. A dream that will demand the painstaking work of countless scientists and engineers. In San Francisco, the Makani wind power team has been struggling. Their high altitude kite soars with a pilot at the controls on the ground. But each time it's set to autopilot, it starts to fall out of the sky. There is no free ride, and there is no silver bullet, and it's, it's a lot of people working really hard around the clock to make anything happen. Launch on three. Now, they think they've finally got it. Launch. You've got to make it work somehow. And that brings out a really neat thing in people. OK, it's autonomous. After years of planning and countless hours of tweaking the design and construction, their new kite is flying on its own. Nicely done. We have a huge problem, and it's not a 
it's not a problem where we need to like go out and get the bad guys or something like that. It's a problem of we need to understand how to make energy in a more effective way. And so it's a wonderful problem. This is where it gets magic. These guys are going to really put on a show now. At the Le Mans Green Challenge, the problem facing the Corvette is that it's now in second place. More to go, guys, and they're not going to give up yet. Watch for the outside pass. He's going to go for it here. Oh, look at the renewable-fueled car is giving its rival the run of its life, but can't quite take the lead from the gasoline-powered Porsche. This is a battle royale. The Corvette uses every trick in the book to find a way around, but nothing is working. Gasoline isn't going down without a fight. Wow. This is it. The last lap. Last lap. If the Corvette is going to make a move, it has to be now. It's got to make it happen right now. It is intense. It's going to try the exit. The challenger attempts a desperate pass down the inside straightaway. Bergmeister drives it to the wall. Down the front straightaway, rubbing it down. And he crashes it big. Oh, they're not going to like that. Boy, oh boy, that was a big hit. It's an ugly finish to a long, tough race. Gasoline wins the day, as it always has. But for those who brought renewable fuels to the track, second place is a win, proof they're getting closer. And no one can say who will go home with the trophy next year. We're in a race against the clock. We've been getting most of our energy from one source for over a century. Energy has helped build the modern world. But now, it's time to make a change. To write the next chapter in the story, we'll need to tap into the elements, transform the way we move, and change the way we live.